Today I want to continue this preventative maintenance series that we started off last time by looking at the engine oil. Engine oil is one of the most important things about any aircraft's engine health. It's a huge and vitally important component, but it is something that legally falls into the FAA's preventative maintenance defined items. So as an owner, you could potentially do your own oil changes and it's probably, if anyone was interested in doing preventative maintenance, oil changes are probably the number one thing they're thinking that they might start to entertain doing themselves. So what I'm going to talk about today is really what oil is, what the typical oil system looks like on a general aviation aircraft, and then also discuss the ways that you might have to change your oil on your aircraft. This is not me telling you how to do anything, but rather me discussing some components to consider if you want to do more research on what you would need to do to be able to change your own engine oil. Just as a reminder, what I'm showcasing here is truly for informational purposes only. This video demonstrates the scope of what preventative maintenance may entail rather than providing a step-by-step -step instructional video of how to do preventative maintenance on your specific aircraft. I'll be demonstrating that for the most part on this Cessna 140, but even if you had a Cessna 140, there's a really good chance because of the modifications that have been done to this one, it's not the same. So even on the exact same airframe, things could be different. Working on an aircraft entails quite a bit of potential risk. Do not attempt maintenance without the supervision of a certified AMP who can verify the specifics for your aircraft. I am not teaching how to perform FAA approved preventative maintenance. Rather, I'm illustrating how to perform preventative maintenance using current FAA guidelines, regulations, and recommendations which are subject to change, meaning this might be outdated by the time that you see it. My goal with this video is to encourage you potentially as an owner or operator of your aircraft to get involved with the maintenance on your aircraft. Not by just jumping straight in, by getting an FAA certified AMP to supervise and show you how you can do some of these very simple items so you can learn more in depth the systems of your aircraft. Always prioritize safety use common sense, and make sure you're following the current and applicable FAA guidelines and recommendations for your specific aircraft. Don't take unnecessary risk by assuming that what I'm doing is going to work for what really needs to be a very specific, tailored process for whatever aircraft you own or are operating. Engine oil has several purposes in any engine. It provides lubrication, reducing metal-to-metal -metal contact and wear. It absorbs some of the heat from the engine, carrying it away from critical components like bearings and pistons. And it can actually clean the engine by suspending dirt or contaminants and preventing their future buildup. A layer of oil on the components like the cam or crankshaft is critical for preventing corrosion, such as rust, from forming. Engine oil also produces a very thin film on the cylinder walls to seal between the piston rings and the walls. Although not used for the combustion process without oil, your engine won't be producing power for very long. Aircraft and automotive oils are much different from one another for a variety of reasons, but one of the main ones is aircraft engines are air-cooled, and that's why your aircraft engines have these fins on the cylinder that you can see in here on my cylinder here. In addition to that, the RPM of an aircraft engine is usually maxed out at less than 2,700 RPM while an automobile can go several thousand more than that. So there's different operating parameters, tighter tolerances in a car than maybe an aircraft engine. And probably the biggest difference between aircraft and automotive engines is the lead content in avgas. To prevent a sludge from occurring in these engines, we have to use something that can deal with the lead and allow it to lubricate the engine and provide an anti-knocking mechanism without causing a gumming or a dilution of the oil's capabilities to lubricate and to cool. Aviation oils don't use detergents like automotive oils do. 
but rather something called an ashless dispersant, identified in most oils by the abbreviation AD. ADs can suspend carbon and debris without forming harmful combustion deposits that could lead to lead fouling of the plugs. It does this by surrounding the contaminants with a coating, suspending them in the oil until it can be removed from the engine and new oil can be added. Ultimately, this leads to a cleaner engine without degrading the lubrication properties of the oil or the lead additives in fuel. There are several different types of engine oils, the first of which is mineral oil, sometimes referred to as type M oil. Uh, this is a pure petroleum product that doesn't have some of the uh, additives like an ashless dispersant that uh, other engine oils use. Because of that, this is typically used for break-in oil only, like if you change a cylinder or if you put an overhaul engine on, you would use mineral oil for a while to allow the piston rings to seat against the cylinder wall. One of the other reasons that you might actually use mineral oil is uh, like I did, but when I restarted uh, working on the Cessna 140 a few years ago, I actually used type M mineral oil in the aircraft. And the thought process was that using the mineral oil would maybe help shave some of that down and reseat the piston rings. So far the oil analysis has looked really well and it seems like that might have actually worked. Um, time will tell, but as of right now, things look really good on the analysis for this engine. The most common type of engine oil that you're going to find in aircraft today is an ashless dispersant. Uh, Phillips XC uh, 20W50 is an ashless dispersant. Actually, it says it is a mineral-based ashless dispersant multi-grade oil for aviation piston engines. Usually on an aircraft engine, we'll change the oil every 50 hours if it's a spin-on filter. I do mine much more frequently than that. Um, I typically do mine about 20, 25 hours because I have a, a screen type filter, as many of you have seen, um, rather than a spin-on filter. So ashless dispersant is by far the most common type of oil that gets used today, but there are other options. As more higher performance engines are making their way into aviation, the need for semi or even fully synthetic oils has become more prevalent. AeroShell 15W50 is an example of a mix of synthetic and mineral oil. The benefit of this oil is improved cold weather performance, better corrosion protection, and reduced oil consumption on some engines. The most basic of all oil systems needs three things. An oil pump, a filtering mechanism, and an oil reservoir. The bottom half of most general aviation aircraft engines serves as the oil reservoir. This is what is referred to as a wet sump because the reservoir is stored on the engine itself. Older aircraft like radials tend to be dry sumps because the oil itself was stored in a completely separate location and sent to and from the engine. The oil pump of many engines is a vane type pump located inside the accessory case. The gears in this pump are directly driven by the crankshaft and force oil into all the crevices and passages as it routes through the engine. If any debris or contaminants are picked up, they are usually removed in some capacity in the filter. There are two types of filter. A highly effective pleated spin-on filter capable of filtering out trash down to about 40 microns and the less effective screens, which also can get down somewhere around 60 microns. All right, so the Cessna 140 has a filter screen. That's it right there, that little silver uh, component with a what looks like a brass nut on the back end of it. This filters at about 60 microns, and that is the first of the two filters. The other one is on the bottom, and it's uh, the coarse screen. Um, it's a little bit larger of a filtering mechanism before it picks up and goes into the pump itself. For the screen type engines, there are always two screens for filtration. This coarse screen is normally housed in the bottom of the oil sump and is designed for preventing large shavings of metal or trash from entering the oil pump. The pressure screen, which is more fine, is typically located on the back of the accessory housing and it's where the oil temperature is sensed on the Cessna 140. Every aircraft engine will have, at minimum, an oil pressure and oil temperature gauge. The pressure gauge alerts the operators of the health of the system and indirectly the capacity of the oil. The temperature notifies the strain of the oil being used to remove the heat from the cylinder. So that line right there above the dipstick that's kind of coming out of the engine that is where the oil pressure is sensed on my engine. It's usually somewhere in that general area, and uh, then for me, the screen is right behind it. This lets oil be filtered at a much higher rate to prevent damaging trash from entering the combustion chambers. On some engines like the Cessna 140, an additional oil component referred to as an oil cooler is used. This does exactly what it sounds like. 
A galley of passages allows for additional airflow to remove heat from the oil as air passes through them. This can be a huge benefit for higher compression engines that run hotter than smaller block engines, especially during the heat of summer. Okay, so here is my oil cooler. You can see where it's mounted right behind the last cylinder here on the left side of this engine. Um, you can also see how air passes through these little cavities right here and then passes through the back side of it right here. And then when it just flows out, it's drawn out the uh, bottom of the cowling down here. Um, oil flows in up here at the top. It's pushed down through to cool off and then it's taken uh, to the engine from there. Most aircraft engines also include an oil pressure relief valve. This is used to regulate the maximum pressure experienced in the oil system. This prevents damage from critical components in the oil system and acts as a safety mechanism for the engine. This is usually located on the right side of the engine above the last cylinder. If the aircraft has a constant speed propeller, this system adjusts the blade angle using engine oil and the propeller governor. Also, turbocharged engines typically use engine oil to cool the turbine, which generates higher pressure for air going into the cylinders. All right, so I have tried to shoot this about as generic as I can. I know it's some of the specifics on the Cessna 140. I highly recommend if you couldn't do this on your aircraft, pull out the maintenance manual, not just the uh, uh, POH or the AFM, but actually get the maintenance manual out and start tracing it. Before starting, make sure that you've gathered all the tools you'll need to safely change the oil on your aircraft. PPE is key as many of the synthetic oils or additives are carcinogens and irritants at the least. Research your aircraft maintenance manual for the proper type and quantity of oil as well as the correct filter if you have a spin on. Read over this maintenance manual several times and make sure that you understand how to do this procedure. If you can't visualize each step you'll be doing during the process, have certified supervision during your oil changes. Screen top filters should always have a replacement crush gasket installed if applicable and never reuse the same gasket on any component. Verify you have the proper safety wire and are comfortable performing this maintenance procedure prior to starting your oil change. No matter how easy it is, it's always nice to have an extra hand while taking off your cowling. So be sure to have a friend or a spouse help you to get this off just so that way you don't accidentally do something embarrassing and damage or break something in the process if you do obviously admit it and make sure that you get that repaired so that way you don't have a potential somewhat structural issue while you are reinstalling the cowling now i know there's a lot of opinions out there about this and there is some information in the lycoming manual but I prefer to uncow the aircraft prior to warming it up. Uh, the one exception for that is the best way to, to warm up an aircraft to change the oil is to fly it. And go fly it and you're gonna get up to normal operating temperatures and that's not gonna cool off as fast as what I'm doing right here. Part of the reason that I uncowled it before I ran the engine was so that way I could observe any potential issues prior to running it. That's kind of a maintenance mindset. I wanted to verify that there were no leaks before I even started the engine so that way if it was something I induced I was aware of it after the maintenance or if it was an already existing problem. I cannot recommend enough personal protective equipment or PPE is the technical term for it but basically gloves and eye protection while you're working on your aircraft. Accidents happen and you want to prevent that as much as possible. I'm a huge proponent for capturing an oil sample for analysis. Um, you can see me here. I wait a few seconds to let the sludge at the bottom, and to be honest, you could wait longer. But I went ahead and caught the sample, and I'm going to capsulate this, seal it up in the bag that they sent, and then put it in their container to ship back to Blackstone Lab, who I use just because they're located relatively close to me up in Indiana. While the oil's draining, it's time to take either the screen out or the filter off. In my engine, I do have a screen. I am removing the pressure screen located on the back side of the engine, and you're gonna wanna clean that screen out. I use a solvent material, whether that's metallic or carbon-based, and then I always try to filter that material, usually just through a shop towel. Typically, I will let this dry out and observe it. 
Uh, even here you can see me, I noticed there was a little bit of carbon, which could be an indication of blow by on the rings. Once that screen is completely clean, you can go ahead and reinstall it. Now always get a new gasket for your filter. And something I learned the hard way was make sure that the gasket actually matches the previous gasket. Human error can occur at aircraft spruce just like it can in your hangar. So make sure somebody hasn't accidentally mispackaged a gasket. If your aircraft engine is equipped with a spin on filter, which filters at that higher rate, you're gonna to want to remove it and drain the filter. You'll also want to buy a cutting tool, and there's several options of these out there that you can research depending on your filter type that allows you to open the filter, and then you're gonna to wanna to remove the pleated filtering mechanism and inspect the inside of it. Be careful as you'll need a knife to cut through this. While you got the cowling off, I always like to encourage people to just take a look, make sure that your baffling looks correct, that nothing is to uh, torn or messed up. Make sure that everything looks like it is functioning correctly. Make sure there's no obvious exhaust leaks or things like that. These aren't things that you can fix, but if you notice that, hey, that stud is loose on that exhaust port, you can reach out to your A&P and let them know that you've got an issue while you were doing your owner preventive maintenance and then they can come out and assist you in that repair. Let's go ahead and put some oil back into our engine. Verify that you've got the filter back installed and the oil drain plug closed before starting. So at this point, I'm going to roll the aircraft out, rerun it, and bring it back in. I'm gonna let it sit overnight and do a leak check tomorrow morning. Basically, I wanna put oil pressure on the system and make sure that nothing that I just did, um, whether it's installing a filter or in my case, reinstalling the screens as well as reinstalling the um, oil pan plug that I didn't accidentally mess anything up and it's not leaking. The last thing you want to do is take off and go fly like a three-hour trip immediately following an oil change. It'd be better to delay your trip even if that means very awkward or unfortunate change of plans than to risk taking off and flying without doing a post-op run, letting it set for at least an hour. Overnight is best to then come back and very closely look and make sure there are no leaks. I cannot stress if you get into a rush and you're trying to beat a deadline on this, you will make a mistake. So do not do that. Simply make the time or make more time or delay your plans altogether. Be safe while you're doing this. For some operators, the most challenging thing may just be to make sure that the documentation has been done correctly. There are three things that are required to go into the logbook. The date, the description of the work performed, and then the signature, certificate type, and number of the individual. We covered that in the first video in the series. In addition to that, I would just recommend that you mimic or copy the same layout that is already in your logbook. I use Excel spreadsheet to keep up with my total time and times and major overhaul. In this case, the 140's total engine time is the same as its time since major overhaul. So it's an easy formula to develop, but then I can actually plug in and write my entry. Now, because the 140 doesn't have a maintenance manual, I have to describe exactly what I did, as well as I include the fact that I do an oil analysis report on this engine, because to me, that's value. If your aircraft did have a maintenance manual, like a DA-40 shown here, then you simply need to reference that manual and then follow the steps outlined in that manual to verify that you have safely and correctly done what the manufacturer has prescribed to do their engine oil change or preventive maintenance in general. I hope you've actually found this informational, maybe even enjoyable to watch and to learn a little bit about this, not just how to change the engine oil, but maybe even the system itself. I hope to see you next time when we're gonna dive into another preventative maintenance item that you can do on your aircraft. Have a good one.